Howdy. So last week I was invited to go see a special edition of the Festival Mondial du Cirque de Demain. It's playing at Tohu until March 3rd, 2013. Apologies for not getting this up quicker, but as you can see, doing video is not as quick and easy as just plain writing. Initially I was going to post a fairly straightforward compilation of clips from the show, talk over them as I gave my opinions. But then when I went back to watch what I had shot, I realized that it might not actually be the best thing, mostly due to my lack of skills at filming stuff. So then I had the absolute brilliant idea of starting with the end. This was the reaction of the audience on Tuesday, the 21st of February. As you can see in here, pretty much everybody had a grand old time. In a nutshell, I did as well. Ten separate acts split up into two parts, all masterfully held together by Calixte de Nutrement, who acted as the master of ceremonies. As I was trying to manipulate a still camera and a video camera while writing notes in the dark, I didn't quite catch everything he said, but I was informed afterwards that he was quite humorous in a Parisian sort of way. Probably best that I didn't catch everything. I'm going to go through the performance one by one in alphabetical order. From some cursory research, it looks like the Festival Mondial du Cercle du Demain is a big thing in Paris. They've been doing it since 1977, and it appears that they take over some of the acts each year and ship them across the Atlantic Ocean. I kind of prefer if they did, in fact, ship all the medal winners over, but I guess beggars can't be choosers, and I would imagine the scheduling logistics could be a little bit difficult. As a consequence, Ba Jiangguo was the only gold medal winner from last year that we got to see. In Paris, there are four gold medals given out. If you're interested, Sarah and Guilhem, Trio Anno, and Louis West got the others. Now, I'm not certain if I should call him Mr. Jiangguo or Mr. Ba, or if in fact Ba Jiangguo is the name of the act, since there were two people involved. One playing what could have been a Pipa, a Ruan, a Likin, or a Quin Quin. I'm not all that up to date on my Chinese stringed instruments that are flat. So I quickly went through Wikipedia, and, they, and those are what looked like what I remember. And another one, and there was another person playing with a top. Okay, I'm being a little silly. He was playing a diabolo, basically a top that is juggled using two sticks attached together with a string. It appears to be easy to do, and at the merch table at Tohu, they sell kid versions that are good for any 7 or 8 year old you might happen to know. Whatever his name is, he wasn't a 7 or 8 year old. Basically whipping it around like a lasso, he did some tricks, throwing it up high, making his hat turn into one, pulling the string from whatever the instrument was and launching it out into the audience at rather rapid speeds. While it is easy in retrospect to see and understand that he has phenomenal technical chops, to me the Diabolo was a simple instrument, tool, or whatever. But I wasn't completely thrilled down to the bottom of my feet, more like a calculated appreciation of his skill. Bert and Fred are from Belgium, and they do something called a Washington trapeze. No, I hadn't heard of it either. In short, a large, heavy trapeze that moves up and down vertically with a special bit so you can also do a headstand on it while it swings side to side while moving up and down. Bert and Fred are a man and woman. They also have these short bits, interludes they call them on their website, where Fred threatens Bert with some sort of physical violence, which he successfully avoids to the surgical precision-like body placement he has. They had one part in their act where they slap each other that made me wince slightly, as I found it hard to condone violence against women in any form, even if they hugged and made up afterwards. The Washington trapeze is graceful and probably extremely hard to do, but like the Diabolo, it doesn't really hold that much of an award in it. Their interludes, on the other hand, made me bust a gut. Between the knife, the darts, the sledgehammer, and the whip, everything was much better than their calls of OK. Chris and Iris did hand-to-hand. -hand. They got a silver medal two years ago. They incorporate simple statements into their act, and if their French was heavily accented, I initially thought they were from the United States of America. But in fact, once I read the program, I discovered that they were from Germany. As with most heterosexual hand-to-hand -hand acts, he is significantly smaller than he is, but in their specific case, he is much more in height than in muscles. We did one bit where he threw around like a medicine ball that I was particularly impressed with, but it was partly because I missed filming that bit that made me rethink how I was going to do the video. Le Gouste Trophée d'Homme had did some weird combo with a marionette, a flute, and something pretending to be a piano, some stem glasses and toe shoes. More serious than any other act, it wasn't a favorite of mine, but nonetheless, I gotta give credit as it was something I never would have imagined in a million years. According to their website, it was created by Lucy Boulet, directed by Christiane Poumet, with Lucy Boulet and Daniel Masson, stage managed by either Thomas Marshall or uh, Arnaud Mignon, since they alternate, and the puppet was made by Joanna Ehlert, although I would swear that there were only three people on stage. Apparently, it was an even shorter version of something they called Camilla et son tennis. I guess it goes over great with adolescent girls and other people going through hormonal changes. If you hadn't noticed, I'm not an adolescent girl, nor am I, as far as I know, going through any hormonal changes. Lisa Rini was another German actor. She won a silver medal two years ago as well. She was also the only artist who made the audience gasp as once she was on the trapeze. There was one time when she did a flipping piston somersault thing where it seemed for a brief instant that she had missed re-grasping the trapeze. But fortunately, she was able to regain her hold, and so the show continued. A major chunk of her act involved working on a rope ladder, which was nice, quite nicely done. Particularly, there's one thing where she uh, balanced her entire bodily horizontally on one arm while holding onto one of the uppermost rungs. 
Then there was a particular method of descending where she sort of slithered snake-like in a spiral head first from the top to the bottom. Still not entirely certain how she did that, but it was particularly well done. Which brings up another nice point. This was a circus that did not have any particularly linking thread, storyline, or narrative. Just a bunch of disparate performers who had been brought together because of what I can only presume were a variety of reasons relating from Metals 1 to availability being in the right time at the right place to other reasons that I can't even guess at. As such, it was quite refreshing. Seemingly old school in comparison to some of the other circuses I've seen recently where they unsuccessfully tried to impose some sort of rationale to why all the stuff was happening. Monsieur Denis Cremont, as ringmaster, if you will, master of ceremonies, was more than sufficient to keep everything running smoothly and connected. While I might have had difficulties with some of the acts themselves, or on a practical level in their actual performance, I can't complain about the format. If anything, it reminded me of the circuses from my childhood, where, as I was much less critical, it seemed that there was just this endless parade of people doing phenomenal and amazing things, one after the other after the other, until it was time to go home. As long as I'm talking about the practical aspects of the circus, I think it's high time that Tohu allow food and beverage into their space. I'm not talking three-course meals with silverware and linen napkins, nor am I talking about having people wander through the stands in order to sell you stuff. But it would be nice if there's popcorn, chips, cotton candy, and other boardwalk type of food available. And I'm certain that parents would agree with me 100%. And perhaps instead of sodas, maybe a nice selection of juices and some adult beverages. I'm fairly confident that the extra revenues would more than offset the extra costs of cleaning up the place after each performance. Then my final critique of Tohu would be that they seriously need to improve the merch table. While I don't mind the black and white seemingly photocopied programs that have never quite have all the information that I think they should, they really don't live up as mementos of an evening or matinee that will be cherished forever and ever. What about a full color, glossy, oversized programs with lots of pictures of the performance in action? Just perfect for getting your autographs. What about t-shirts, baseball hats, not with the Tohu logo, but of the circus who is performing, or of one of the performers? DVDs of the performance, large, color, glossy pictures of the performers, CDs or USB sticks of the music played. I'd suggest starting out quite conservatively, making just enough items so that 5% of the audience for the run of the show would be able to purchase stuff, and then quite aggressively letting people know that there were limited edition items never again to be remade. Then, depending on the reaction, slowly step up production until there was enough data to be able to confidently guess what demand was going to be like. Since the circus troops themselves never have any excess money to be able to do stuff like that themselves, Tofu offered to front the cash necessary for production. I'm fairly certain that the circus companies would then be more than willing to give Tohu a larger percentage of each sale. But enough of me trying to tell the fine folk of Tohu how to run their business. Let me get to the, back to the main task at hand of telling you what the Festival d'Al Mondial du Cirque de Demain was like. I think of all the acts, Morgan, the juggler from France, was my favorite. Or maybe he died for favor. Due to his insistence on using only his first name, his website was one of the tougher ones to find. For the record, his last name is Kuske. And in the entry for this video over at Zeke.com, you can find links to his website along with links to all the other performers. I think the reason I got such a kick out of his performance had an awful lot to do with the fact that he just seemed to exude joy. He'd won a silver medal five years earlier, so I can only presume that he had learned a lot since then. And while he closed out his act by juggling seven balls, the large majority and the best part of his act was centered around him simply tossing one ball around with his feet. Deceptively simple looking and probably insanely difficult to do is actually aided by a couple of minor mistakes that Morgan did. As is the case with 21st century circus, if you aren't able to accomplish the feat the first time, for the most part you get second and third and sometimes even fourth chances to get it right. All of this is one other method of getting the audience to actually sympathize with the performer, not only appreciate the skills that they're using, but get them to actively root for them. Kind of similar to professional athletes, just not paid quite as well, and without a connection that is as long lasting. Anyhow, there's this one stunt where Morgan pantomimes what he's going to do in advance. As I understood it, he was going to try to launch the ball from his right foot through a circle made by his right arm touching his shoulder, return through a similar circle formed by his left arm touching his shoulder, and then be caught on his left foot. He then continued to the pantomime of how once he'd accomplished the feat, he was going to prance around like Sylvester Stallone at the top of the steps in the first Rocky movie and accept any and all applause offered by the audience. It took him something like seven tries, but he finally got it and the applause was definitely. By contrast, Natalie Enterline did not interact with the audience at all touting as doing the twirling back home. Someone really should take Tohu aside and offer to help with their translations. She was the only other gold medal winner to perform here in Montreal. However, her gold medal came to the 7th Mondial du Cercle de Domaine, which just so happens to have taken place 27 years ago. To her credit, they also gave her a medal of honor last year, but I seriously doubt she was anywhere near the same age as the other performers who, according to the rules, had to be under the age of 25. Nor did she really do any baton twirling, sadly. She came on stage, did a brief imitation of Charlie Chaplin, and switched into some bright red suit that would have been appropriate about 27 years ago, all the while strutting around and doing what looked more like baton shaking than baton twirling. I don't know if they have drum majorettes in France, but I've seen some high school bands that had a better baton twirling than this Enterline. Weirdly, on the night that I saw it, she was the last act to appear. 
I don't know if they all appeared in the same order night after night, but she definitely was a downer at the end. On her website, she writes in her bio that she met the legendary juggler Francis Brunt here in Montreal and started to collaborate with him, which can go a long way towards explaining how what she was doing was much more like juggling than baton twirling. After looking up who he was, I felt kind of bad. She definitely was trying to push limits, boundaries, and go beyond the box and the envelope, but it took me some serious research to discover. It would have been relatively simple to add to either the paragraph about her in the program or stick it into a press kit if Toki deigned to make press kits. On Zeke.com, I'll have some links to Francis Brunt so you can understand. Sometimes background information can help. A lot. One of the things I don't quite get about new circuses is how they have decided that while it is acceptable not to have animals, it is also acceptable to have contortionists. In my experience, most contortionists look like 12-year-old girls who wear skin-tight leotards and end up in positions where I, as a 50-year-old guy, can't help but looking straight at their crotch. Their slightly plainer language, they make me uncomfortable as fuck. I can remember one night, the night of my grandparents' 50th anniversary, when my just a little bit too tipsy grandmother, who I adored, insisted she could still put her leg around her neck like she used to when she was 20. I cringed and quickly moved to another room. I had no desire to see her break herself, especially since I know I wouldn't be able to fix her. Well, surprises, surprises. Robert and Abili were, as you can tell from one of the names, not girls, but they were still contortionists. In fact, they were both guys and they were still contortionists. As Monsieur Denis Cremont said, they were the first African acts ever to win medals at the Festival Mondial du Cirque de Demain, which isn't exactly something I'd be thumping my chest about, as it kind of made me wonder why it had taken the festival that long. Heck, the USA elected a black president in 2008. Raoul Diagne was the first black soccer player in Ligue 1, and if I remember my jazz history, I thought Paris was a refuge from the racism of the states for most of the 20th century. What the heck took the Festival Mondial du Cirque de so gosh darn long? Then while there were guys, I still had my standard issue awkwardness with composure, as these still made the audience focus on their crotches. Serious props to them for incorporating strength conditioning into the act. And no matter how hard I tried to avoid the thought, I couldn't avoid wondering if they could give themselves a blowjob which no matter how you cut it, kind of interferes with the rest of the circus vibe. I don't know if it is because I was the only one in the audience of 1,500 at Tohu who had their mind in the gutter and was incapable of getting it out of there, or if it was something else. But to me, putting contortion acts instead of animals in contemporary circuses are kind of like the guy who says he reads Playboy for the articles. On the surface, it makes sense, but once you look at it with any amount of seriousness, you realize it's a load of clock. Then again, I could be just a prude. Which brings me to the last act, alphabetically. Starbucks from Switzerland doing what they call rhythmic comedy. Fabio Tinu and Silu, also known as Fabian Berger, Martin Bircher, and Wasilis Riga. Apologies for my accent and the butchering of their names. Like Mr. Monsieur Tuske, they have taken advantage of the five years since they won a medal to seriously hone their craft and skills. Since five years ago, they didn't even get a bronze medal, and this year, in my estimation, they tied for the best act. Rhythmic comedy, the way that Starbucks perform it, is kind of what you get if you cross the rock steady crew with the Three Stooges, all done to an insanely complicated soundtrack where various random sound effects are inserted into pop music hits working as cues for complex physical movement. I'm certain that they have many different sketches, but here in Montreal they had one brilliant where it were Tinu, or at least I think it was Tinu, they all kind of look alike, dances in the middle of Silu and Fabu and manages to hit, trip, poke, and otherwise accidentally beat them up, all the while keeping up a rather complicated bit of choreography. A mo motorcycle piece was probably the weakest part of the rack. However, Silu, or at least I think it was Silu, as I said, they all kind of look alike, beating himself up is a gut buster. As you might expect, there are way more hits than misses in what they do. The opening number was done by students from the École Nationale du Cirque, who were directed by Julie Vachins, who, according to her bio over at the Cirque du Soleil, has been teaching since, like, forever. Okay, 1987. And Nicolas Germain, a professor there since 2005, who originally hails from saint valery en caux a small town in northern France. The act itself wasn't bad. A little bit of everything. There were at least a dozen folk on stage doing just about every type of circus act under the sun. And then there's also something they called the barrier, which I think was this thing where they had at the back of the stage where they were able to get something like another 10 kids involved. The music was directed by Francois Morel, who I don't think is the same Francois Morel as the one who was the Knight of the National Order of Quebec and was awarded the Petit Denis Peltier in 1996. The actual musicians were Oliver Caron, Laurent Fals, who I think played drums, Frank Guichard, who I think played the trumpet, Christophe Gruel, possibly on guitar, Louis Paralis, who might have played the keyboards, and Cedric Ricard, who, if Google is right, played flute and saxophone. I wasn't able to figure out what instruments Monsieur Cajon played because his name is way too common. Tickets cost in between $36 and $55, although since it took me this gosh darn long to get this up, I have no idea if in fact there are any tickets left. For your sake, I hope so, because if you've slogged all the way through this, you probably deserve to get a ticket. As I mentioned earlier, I quite like circuses that have no overriding narrative or theme, just a collection of people doing cool stuff. The only real criticism of the special edition of the Festival Mondial du Cirque de Demain would be that I prefer that the Montreal version looks more similar to the Paris version. Maybe not including all the acts, but all the awarded winning acts would be nice. 
It would have been nice, as I said, to see the other gold medal winners, Sarah and Guilhem, especially since they're local, Trio and Ope, Louis West, along with the silver medal winner, Angelica Bongiovanni, especially since she's a local, and the bronze medal winners, Eric Bates, since he's a local, Robert Moraine, Pepin, Catch, Catch, Tar, Catch a Trian, and Duo XY, since they're local as well. And another thought, since the Festival Mondial de Cirque de Demain focuses on artists under the age of 25, what about starting something like the Festival Mondial du Cirque d'Hier, competition between circus artists all over the age of 35 or 40? Or maybe clowns over the age of 50 and anyone doing something physical older than 35 or 40? That way, Tohu and the Cirque Phoenix, the guys who run it in Paris, could do some sort of co-production on the greatest hits versions, which they could then trade and then possibly tour. Plus, I'm always a big fan about knowing your history. There should not have been any reason why I had to do the research myself to figure out who Francis Brun was. And actually, that was another weird thing. Given that Herr Brun was known for juggling one ball, I don't know why the organizers decided to include Monsieur Cascade. Did they not realize that there were going to be comparisons? Either way, it was a fun time. I'm looking forward to keeping an eye on the various performance careers and seeing them again and again and again.